Hi, and welcome to Secrets of Being Santa Claus. I'm your host, Stuart Deacon Jr., also known as Santa Stewart. Today we're reviewing the basic production process of, and hopefully answering your questions about, the few suits and Santa pieces I've constructed. After my first season, I began researching fabrics. I do have a Joann's about 30 miles down the highway, but there wasn't a great difference in reds or the specific type of fabric I was looking for. As such, I ended up spending over $100 during the course of a year and a half on swatches from online stores alone. I have little samples of upholstery fabric in all the dark colors and light colors of red. I was set on having something similar to my second suit, which was a bright red, but a sort of velvet fabric. I'm still not an expert on fabric, and I'm not sure what the fabric was exactly, but I knew the feel of it and that I needed something similar. I discovered velveteen and how affordable it was. I found a shade that would work and was deeper than scarlet. For my suit, I wanted a more serious and magical tone, and less of the Coca-Cola bright red. Fur wasn't great either. Having started out with an online suit that had decently soft fur, I wanted something that was the same texture but I couldn't find the exact same fur. The polyester and acrylic blend was soft, and in the end I decided to find something else that would work just as well. Towards the end of my third season, I met another Santa. Santa Stuart Landerman of Idaho Falls said a fur rug had worked well for his getup, and so I started shopping online in the rug departments and found some really good deals and some really good fur. From the beginning, I'd been researching different looks and suit styles that I found had something that I liked. The best source for suits were different Santa films and the BTS photos, that's behind the scenes photos, and footage behind the movies. This allowed for the suit to be seen from different angles so I could see what worked and what didn't. Oftentimes I had to pause the film or take a screenshot of a particular angle to add to my visual references photo folder on my computer. My favorite Santa Claus of all time is the Tim Allen Santa. His suits were amazing and changed throughout the films. I love how they tweaked things just enough so it didn't look so factory built and more a custom one of a kind coat. Though I'm not the height or have the girth of Tim Allen in the films, I was able to pull some basic stylistic measurements off of photos from the film. I paid attention to where the fur was on his sleeves, where the coat ended on his thighs, and where the belt was placed in relation to those two. This would help with knowing how much longer than the typical coat my suit would have to be. I also noticed the sleeves weren't as wide as many suits have. They were mainly form-fitting. Again, a custom one-of-a-kind style coat. From there, I knew I would be making at least two different suits, a coat and a robe that would echo back to my heritage as a British citizen for a Father Christmas look. I had an experience from sewing from scratch, so I found a Santa suit pattern that would cover both a suit and a robe. I would be altering the pattern, but I needed a good starting place. This also helped in sizing because I ordered a small to large size of pattern where many of this brand were for extra large and up. I'm not the biggest guy and none of my previous suits had been made with smaller guys in mind. The link to this McCall's pattern is in the description below. I bought a sewing machine and had my wife teach me how to thread it. From there I used some cheap fabric to make a mock-up of the suit following the pattern. I pinned and made marks on it, wore it with my stuffing and made notes. From there, I was confident enough to alter the pattern for the coat and the pants. I made the trousers first. The biggest problem I've had in the past with Santa pants is they were never long enough for me not to worry. I wanted these trousers to have length so I could sit down, get on and off a float and in and out of my car without worrying that the pants would come untucked from my socks and over the boots. I added about two inches to the pattern and got rid of the center seam in each leg. Next was the fly. After I made my first set, I realized I didn't need a fly in my trousers, and zippers weren't going to be, you know, they just wouldn't look nice with my limited experience with sewing. I also added a drawstring around the waist, which has ended up helping keep them in place, as well as provide adequate thickness for the suspenders to latch firmly onto without tearing the fabric. I also got rid of the pockets. It would just be a hassle to remember where I put everything. If I do a gig where I need pockets, I'll have a bag on my belt. But many of the gigs are home visits and taking toy orders and parties. I don't need to have my car keys and phone waiting to fall out while I'm sitting down. 
Plus, it's a challenge for me now to be more organized when I go out and do visits. The coat came together nicely, and I took it up a few inches from where I originally had it. I overcompensated on purpose so I could trim back if needed, knowing I couldn't add on more fabric than what I had on there. The rug I'd gotten needed to be trimmed. I didn't want one and a half inch fur. It just looked thin and wiry. I spent a few nights using a set of hair clippers I bought just for this and trimmed it down using the 3 8 attachment. But the hair is not 3 8 in length. It's just shorter all around and much thicker. With subsequent suits, I discovered it easier to cut the pieces of the fur out first and then trim those down instead of trimming the whole uncut rug, if that makes any sense. Cut it out, trim it down. The liner was a piece of cake, the collar was a headache, as the Peter Pan style of collar wasn't in the original pattern. Eventually I went back and redid the collar once I'd found a good enough pattern for it online. The zipper up the front I had to put on twice, and it's alright, still working with it, but it does its job. It's a complete mess though, you don't want to see it close up. The part that took the longest was the belt loops, surprisingly. I wanted belt loops that looked nice, were where the belt actually would rest and wouldn't rip through. I ended up making two belt loops. I made a loop that was snug and would fit up to a four inch belt width, but then covered it with a faux belt loop with deer buttons at the bottom of the belt loops, much like on Tim Allen's suit. The reasons for doing this was I wanted the buttons held there by thread, but I didn't want the weight of the belt on that same thread. I felt this was a great way to eliminate the chances of losing a button when wearing it, while also making it functional, so lots of work. The belt loops aren't on there in a straight line either. They are straight vertically, but when it comes to the horizontal placement, they follow the waist of the stuffing that I wear to give it a more natural look. The back two are in the same placement, as are the front pair, but they're not all together. There's about a half inch difference in placement there. The belt comes behind my back and then down the front to my belly. I just, I wanted it like that. As for the robe, everything but the hood and fur was in the pattern. I lengthened the robe by a few inches, but kept it around my boot fur height so that when I added fur to it, it wouldn't drag on the floor and get filthy. There aren't any belt loops on this one. As I discovered, I didn't need one to keep the belt there. Another reason for not having belt loops is so that I could wear it without a belt and have it look purposeful. I didn't want to look like a bathrobe that, you know, the tie had gone missing. The fur on the robe was trimmed a bit longer, though just another rug I found online. The fur was sewn with stuffing inside to puff it out and give it weight. When I made my wife's robe afterwards, I did a very similar thing but sewed the fur to the suit the other side of the fur to the liner, and then went in between the two layers and sewed the fur together, so it brought the fabric and liner together, if that makes sense. <laughs> in my robe, I just sewed everything together, and it looks like the amateur job it is when you get a good look at it, so we will not be visiting any close-ups of, uh, of the stitching. The hats were a different matter altogether, and I'm very, very proud of how they turned out. I made two hats between the time I made my suit to the time I made my robe, the fur had to be wide enough to be doubled up as well as not squish my wig and make it flare out on the sides. I opted for a more Tim Allen style hat without putting in the stuffing to make it the same shape as his, as it looks to be in the film. He's got more of a crescent, you know, I just wanted mine to drape. Um, I'm happy with the way it looks now. I don't think I'll be changing it anytime soon. With the suit, you can definitely see the Tim Allen inspiration, but it does lack the beautiful embroidery and standard of production that his have. The robe is very much like a little brother version to the one Santa Stuart Landerman had his Mrs. Claus make for him a few years back. But in the end, my final advice is this, wash the fabric and get the dye to stop bleeding. If you're making your own suit and, and other pieces, find what works to set that dye and do all that work before you're out in the snow and things start blending together and getting wet, I can't stress preparation enough. If you want to sew a suit, do research and prepare. Just doing these three get-ups has really given me the experience I need to make another few suits in a couple years. It was a lot of work, but the most rewarding things in life are seldom easy, and this was a really great learning experience for me. This has been Secrets of Being Santa Claus. I'm your host, Stuart Deacon Jr., also known as Santa Stewart. Thanks for watching.